host of Sun America NBC pregame show. The 1999 National League Championship Series. Tonight, it's game one. The New York Mets versus the Atlanta Braves. It rained rather heavily just a short time ago in Atlanta, but it has stopped. The tarp has been removed. We're ready to play baseball at Turner Field. The Braves will go with four-time Cy Young Award winner Greg Maddox, 19-9 in 1999. Masato Yoshi, right-hander, 12-8, will oppose him for the Mets. Welcome to Game 1 of the NLCS from Atlanta with Joe Morgan. I'm Bob Costas. Joe, all the talk leading up to this series, a much-anticipated series, has included not just the usual speculation about Mike Piazza, who will, by the way, play. His sore left thumb has responded to treatment. He'll bat cleanup and start tonight. Not the usual speculation about the relative strengths of the teams on the mound, at the plate, in the field, but lots of talk about bad blood between the Braves and the Mets. What do you make of it? Well, two people have clearly put themselves in the sights of the other team. First, Chipper Jones destroyed the Mets here by hitting four home runs in a three-game sweep, and then he went to New York, and they won the last game, and he thought they were dead, and he said, now all the Mets fans can go home and put on their Yankee stuff. That did not make the Mets happy or their fans. And then Bobby Valentine fired back. He said, they do not respect us. He said, they feel like they can beat us anytime they want. They said, Atlanta's going to have to be playing against some ghosts because we have come back. So these two guys have really put themselves in the spotlight. Bobby Valentine's going to have to do a good job managing, and Chipper Jones is going to have to continue to swing that hot bat. Well, let's hear from the managers, beginning with Bobby Cox, who is with our Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob. I'm now joined by the manager of the Braves, Bobby Cox. Bobby, there have been many words exchanged between Bobby Valentine, the manager of the Mets, and Chipper Jones and some of the other guys. What do you make of all this talk? I haven't read any of it, Jim, so I, I really don't know. We're here to, to play a baseball game against two really good ball clubs. So Certainly you've heard of it, though. A little bit, not much, to be honest with you. I don't pay a lot of attention to a lot of stuff that goes away from this ballpark you know anything I'm worried about is what goes on in our dugout so you know we're here to play baseball and I think that's what's going to happen is there a basic dislike for lack of a better term between the Mets and the Braves I don't think any <laughs> I don't think there's any uh, any problem there they've got a real class act uh, uh, ball club I think a lot of good guys in that ball club and certainly take them all over here but uh, they don't have a guy on there I wouldn't take this is a very relaxed group I saw where your boss Ted Turner walked by to you and he said hey I can't wait to go quail hunting. It's got to be pretty good to have a boss who well, seemingly has no concerns before a big game like this. I think the reason Ted said, said that is uh, every year annually, we, uh, if we make the playoffs, we get to go quail hunting at one of his ranches. So John Sherholtz and I have been fortunate enough to go down there and hunt with Ted, and it is a lot of fun. We do it in January, first week in January or so. So, you know, it's a lot of fun. Final thought, how much pressure is there on the Braves to be solidified as the team of the 90s to go on and win this series and onto a World Series? Well, that's another thing I don't pay a lot of attention to, Jim. Uh, you know, this thing is year to year, to be honest with you, and uh, we will, day as soon day. as all this is over with, yeah, it's day to day, we'll start worrying about next year, and, you know, the historians can write down anything they want about the organization then. Bobby, thank you. Best thank of you. luck to you. All right, and with that, we now welcome Craig Sager from Turner Sports with us throughout the rest of the playoffs in the World Series. Well, Bobby, the last time you saw the Braves, Chipper Jones basically told your fans to get out the Yankee gear because the Mets season was through. What effect did that have on you guys? Probably none, but it might have a little effect on our fans. You know, we're here to play baseball, not talk about it or, you know, think about it, just play it. But you personally, did you take it against yourself or the team? I didn't really hear it until about a week later, and uh, we were already in the playoffs at that time. So that's kind of cool. I, I, you know, was reminded of it when uh, when we won the wild card or maybe won that one, one game playoff, and uh, it kind of was there. The scouting report on Chipper is don't give him fastballs across the middle of the plate. Yeah, you guys did that a lot during the last series. He had seven home runs during the regular season against you. How do you pitch him tonight? Well, I dare say, don't give anybody who's a major league player fastball down the middle of the plate, and Shipper does particular damage with it. Uh, you know, we have to pitch everybody tough in their lineup. They scored almost 900 runs. They're a bunch of great uh, players, and Shipper's even a little better than most. Uh, so make good pitches, change speeds, work it in and out, throw your breaking ball when you're behind and count, buzz them inside. Do all the things that uh, are prerequisite to be in a major league pitch. And we have some of them. After losing 9 out of 12 during the regular season, do you have to change the mental approach with your team for tonight? Boy, 
boy, if I could have, I would have changed it before. I think our mental approach is really good. Uh, we've won 100 games, and, and we're on an upswing. All right, thanks a lot. How back to you, Bob. Craig, thank you. And before we break for a commercial here, a story not from baseball, but one concerning one of the greatest figures in the history of sports. Wilt Chamberlain died today. A giant, both literally and figuratively. The Big Dipper was to basketball, at least statistically, what Ruth was to baseball, Gretzky to hockey. He once scored 100 points in a single NBA game. Another time, he pulled in 55 rebounds against Bill Russell, no less. And in 1962, he averaged 50 points a game. With one exception, 1967, Wilt's teams couldn't beat Russell's Celtics. That led to the oversimplified conclusion that Wilt, for all his gifts, wasn't a winner. But with the passage of time, Chamberlain's accomplishments and his place in the history and mythology of the sport loom large. Somebody once said, nobody ever roots for Goliath. But Wilt Chamberlain's place in history is secure. He was 63. After this break, the starting lineups and the first pitch, game one of the NLCS from Atlanta. A short while ago at Turner Field, Andres Galarraga, a big part of the Braves the past couple of years, sidelined this season by cancer. He's responded well to treatments. He donned his uniform. He'll actually be in uniform on the bench. And he threw out the ceremonial first pitch. He's expected to be back for the 2000 season. He's with our Jim Gray. All right. Thank you very much, Bob. It was a very stirring moment just a few moments ago. Andres, how are you feeling and what's the prognosis? Well, I feel very good right now. And I thank you, God, for um, giving me right now a uniform. Uh, they do another cascade today, and I really posted it. The bone is more strong right now, and I'm kind of happy to be in uniform right now with the team. You've come back, and you've been with the team the past five weeks. How have you been able to help the guys on the bench, and what exactly is your role, and how do you try and fit in while you can't play? Well, as soon as I put in my uniform, I'm just, you know, try to be happy to enjoy the team, to be what I like to be in uniform. And, I, you know, I try to help in every... Uh, Andrews, at least to what they're doing wrong, hoping Don Belo, at least like another coach. And I also, you know, calling for those guys to keep him going all the way to the World Series. Well, it's great to see everybody's happy, you're feeling well, and we look forward to seeing you play next year, Andre. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's send it across the way to the Mets dugout and Craig Sager. Well, thanks, Jim. The last time we saw Todd Pratt, he had just hit a dramatic 10th inning home run to send the Mets in a National League Championship Series. For a guy that was out of baseball three years ago working at a pizza parlor, how do you respond to all the attention of the dramatic home run you hit? Uh, it's quite humbling. Uh, you know, I was just happy the team uh, was able to advance, and, you know, now it's time to put up a shut up. Well, tonight you're on the bench again. Mike Piazza is back. You've worked with him last couple of days in batting practice. How will he be affected with a sore thumb tonight? Uh, he says he feels great. Uh, the core zone shot now is working. Uh, all the inflammation's down in his thumb. And, uh, you know, yesterday he was taking BP out here and hitting home runs after home run. So uh, he's ready to go. Speaking of home runs, how many times do you watch the replay? Uh, as much as I can. It's just an uh, incredible feeling. What about some of the people that may have called you? Congratulating you, those that stuck by you all those years? Oh, yeah. I've had many phone calls, a lot of emails. Uh, you know, I'm just thanks for the support, and, you know, I'm just happy for the New York Mets. At this point, are you not in the lineup tonight? Uh, not at all. Uh, Mike's our man. You know, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here, and, uh, you know, I'm looking for him to lead us again. And if it wasn't for you, the Mets wouldn't be here either. Congratulations on that great series. All right. Thanks a lot. Let's go back to Bob and Joe. Craig, thanks. Talk about a guy who took his name out of the agate type and placed it in the headlines, Todd Pratt. Short while back, up and down three times in a single season between the minors and the majors. He worked at Bucky Dent's baseball school for a while, was out of baseball entirely for a year. Actually went to the World Series once with the Phillies in 93 as a backup, although he didn't play in the World Series against Toronto. Oral Hershiser not in the starting rotation. Probably the first guy out of the bullpen in a long man situation for Bobby Valentine tonight. During the year, the Braves won 9 out of 12 from the Mets. Maddox was 3-1 and one against New York. He shut them out twice, had another victory against them, and then in his final appearance of the year, in the season's final week, he was hammered at Shea Stadium. John Olerud had a grand slam against him. So overall for the year, Maddox was 3-1 and one against New York. Each of the last two years, the Braves have won 9 out of 12 against the Mets. In 1998... They won the last three games of the year here, part of a five-game swoon at the end of the season for New York that cost the Mets the wild card. 
The Braves sent the Mets on their way to a seven game losing streak by sweeping here a three game series in late September and it looked like the Mets would wind up in the same place losing the wild card but somehow they regrouped in the season's final weekend sweeping three from the Pirates winning the playoff game with Cincinnati going on to beat Arizona in the division series and like Bobby Valentine said the Braves are facing in effect a ghost they thought the Mets were dead and they have to contend with them again here's the Budweiser starting lineup for the Mets Alfonso on fire had a home run in the one game wild card playoff against the Reds and then hit three of them including a grand slam in the division series against Arizona Arizona. And Greg Maddox did not have a Maddox type year, although he won 19 ball games with a high earn run average 3.57. Plus, he get, gave up more hits than any other pitcher in the league 258 hits. That's very un Maddox like. But he also knows how to win, and he will find a way to win. And let's take a look at the defense behind Maddox. They have nine career gold glove does Maddox. He's looking for his 10th straight gold glove this year. And the center fielder, Andrew Jones, another gold glover. Brett Boone has won a gold glove at second base. And Walt Weiss made what for Atlanta was the defensive play of the year with his stop and throw to the plate in the bottom of the 10th at the Astrodome in game three of the division series. The Braves somehow got out of a bases loaded nobody out situation behind John Rocker, won that game, broke the Astros back, and completed the 3-1 victory in the division series the next day. And the reason you put Weiss in there tonight instead of Jose Hernandez, who has a bigger bat, is because Maddox is a ground ball pitcher, and you need the defense behind Maddox. And I think you have to try to match the defense of the Mets. So as Bobby Valentine put it, the Braves have to deal with a ghost. But the Mets are haunted to some extent themselves. They've lost 13 of their last 14 games in this ballpark. I don't think the Mets are thinking about that now, Bobby. I believe the Mets realize that they have a good enough ball club to defeat the Braves here. They just have to play sound, fundamental baseball and do not make any mistakes. The one-strike pitch to Ricky Henderson. Just missed. Ed Montague, the plate umpire. Jeff Kellogg at first. Charlie Relaford at second. Ed Rapawano at third. Jerry Lane has the left field line. Jerry Crawford, the right field line. And a bouncing ball to the left side. Chipper Jones cuts in front of Weiss and takes care of Henderson. And that's what Maddox will do to you. He will make you hit a lot of ground balls. He throws a lot more fastballs than people realize. He starts it in the middle and he relies on movement to get the hitters out. He doesn't have an overpowering fastball. He uses a changeup quite often and he changes up off his fastball. So it looks like the same pitch. Then he'll mix in a slider and he has a curveball, but his curveball is probably his worst pitch. But the thing that makes him a great pitcher is all of the pitchers look the same coming out of his hand. And he will throw any pitch on any count. Blowing away, ball one. More often than not, you find yourself saying strike one with Maddox. He will get ahead on the count so often. A ball and a strike. Breaking ball, lined to left by Alfonso, racing over for the catch is Gerald Williams, although he nearly overran it. Well, that was the curveball, and then as I said, that's his fourth best pitch. And he was, and it was hammered by Alfonso. He throws the slider a lot of times, and the changeup, and the fastball. And this is his curveball, and you can see it doesn't break as sharply as he would like. Gerald Wilson got a good jump on it, but. As Bob said, he almost overran it. And now Olerud, the last swing he took against Maddox, resulted in a grand slam at Shea. Inside edge, strike one. Olerud is just three for 17 in his career against Maddox. The grand slam part of that. 0-2. The only ones that own Maddox are Tony Gwynn and Barry Bonds. They hit him very well. Everyone else is kind of susceptible to Maddox. 
A little tap back to the mound. A perfect first for Maddox and the Braves. After a nine-pitch inning for Greg Maddox, here's the lineup Masato Yoshi will face. Chipper Jones feasted on Met pitching this year, especially as Joe noted earlier in the three-game series in late September here where he homered four times in three games. And here's Masato Yoshi. He's been pitching very well lately, so his 4.4 earned run average really kind of misleading at this point. He's been throwing the ball very well, uses a good fastball, a two-seam fastball, which sinks, a riding fastball, a changeup, and a splitter. And let's take a look at this Mets defense, which is the best in baseball, and they made 33 errors on the infield, which is the fewest in Major League history. And you have a guy in center field, Hamilton, Darrell Hamilton, who can really run the ball down. Ricky Henderson won a few gold gloves, not as good now at this late stage of his career as he was before, but still a very good outfield. As a team, the Mets made 68 errors, easily the lowest figure in Major League history. And obviously their fielding percentage was the best ever for a single season for a team. Gerald Williams on the first pitch shoots it right back up the middle for a leadoff single. And well, let's take a look at the scouting report that we have on Masato Yoshi. Fastball, change up, and a splitter. He must keep his pitches down. He kept the ball down there, and Williams grounded it through up the middle for a base hit. But whenever he gets in trouble, he will use the splitter or the change up to get out of trouble. Here's Brett Boone, who hit 252 for the year. Williams at first base stole 19 this year. One. Yoshi is 34 years old, 6'2", 210. 13 seasons in Japan, mostly with the Yakult Swallows, later with the Kanetsu Buffaloes. On the bubble in terms of making the team this spring, in the rotation in the postseason. And Boone fouls it out of play. And Boone is not your typical second place hitter. He struck out over 100 times, and he's a guy that will chase the high fastball. The first two hitters in the Braves lineup, whomever they have been in various combinations this year, had the lowest combined on-base percentage for slots one and two of any team in the National League. There's the splitter. That's the first one he has thrown. The tough thing about the first two hitters in their lineups is not getting on base much. Chipper Jones has suffered, and he only had 110 RBIs, and I say only. There you see the leadoff hitters for the Mets and the Braves. And when you say suffer, that's because he only drove in 110 runs, and you take and look at Ramirez in Cleveland, he drove in 165 runs because his men were always on base. Williams is running. Piazza's throw is forced, and Williams steals it. The pitch missed, and the count goes to 3-1. and one. That's an average jump. I'm not so sure it wasn't supposed to be a hit and run, but you because you saw Williams look back at the plate to see if the ball was hit. That's a that's a pretty good pitch to throw on. He just doesn't get on top of it. He throws it right into the ground. So Williams at second with nobody out. And Boone cuts and misses. Yoshi for the year was 12 and 8. As Joe said, he finished the regular season in strong fashion. But in his division series start at Arizona, he gave up six hits, four runs, two homers in five and a third against the Diamondbacks. The Mets came back to win and got Yoshi off the hook. Here's his payoff pitch. Sliced foul. Yoshi was 0 and 2 this year against Atlanta, beaten both times by Greg Maddox. For his career, he's 0-4 against the Braves, and his ERA is above 6 against Atlanta. Well, you can see one good outing and one poor outing. He lost one to nothing after, you know, giving up only one run in seven innings. Another 3-2 pitch. 
fastball, and he got a piece of it. Bobby Cox, who has managed more postseason games than anyone in baseball history. Bobby Valentine in the postseason for the first time in his career after more than 1,700 games managed in the majors. Up the middle, and Ordonez can't get it. Williams being waved home. It's 1-0 Atlanta. Fastball. This was the ball out of the strike zone, but he gets on top of it and he hits it right back through the middle. You can see that pitch is up, and he hammers down on it and grounds it back through the middle for a base hit and an RBI. And it doesn't get any easier as they have to deal with Chipper Jones and Brian Jordan on deck. Bob, I think it's important for the Mets to go after Chipper Jones early in this series. You have a seven-game series, so you have time to feel the other team out. You have to go after. If you start running from a hitter in the first inning of a seven-game series, you can really find yourself in a lot of trouble. And who knows if he's swinging the bat as well right now as he was three weeks ago. You have to find out right away. Fastball high. He did cool off a bit in the division series against the Astros. Let's check with Jim Gray. All right, thanks, Bob. Well, Chipper Jones didn't really want to add any more fuel to this fire with the Mets and with the Mets fans and so forth. Refused all interview requests today. Is trying to keep a low profile. Only wants to speak after the games. He does not want to give them any more bulletin board material. Bob? He lays off the 1-0 pitch. And Yoshi is behind him 2-0. And that's the problem that you face sometimes when you try to make perfect pitches to good hitters, and then you fall behind 2-0 and or 3-1, and one, and then you have to give them a pitch to hit. But if you're going to pitch to Chipper Jones, that's the spot to pitch to him. Fastball's in tight, but you can't leave the ball out over the plate. If you're going to throw the fastball, it has to be in on the corner or a little bit off the inside corner. He likes the ball out over the plate. And when you can get ahead of him, you can get him to chase pitches down and in with this splitter that Yoshi has. His 2-1 pitch. Foul back. Here's some evidence as to why Chipper Jones is the likely National League MVP. Among the leaders in several important offensive categories. The 45 home runs, the most in a single season by any switch hitter not named Mickey Mantle. The 2-2. Full count. What do you do with Boone at first? Nobody out. Jordan on deck. Well, Boone was going on the one and one pitch. He had such a big lead. I don't know why he stopped. He had a great jump, and then he stopped. Maybe he felt like he was bothering Chipper down at first base. Well, if you're Yoshi, you've thrown him a lot of fastballs in. You have to either come in with a fastball or throw the splitter. Boone goes. And now he can slow up. He strolls into second on the walk to Chipper Jones. Well, he made two good quality pitches, two fastballs in on the hands. He fouled them both back, and he could not get another one in. There's Earl Hershiser up throwing in the bullpen. He would be the first long man to be used tonight. Let's take a look at the sequence of pitches that were thrown to Chipper Jones. First pitch is a fastball up and out of the strike zone. The splitter down and in. Now he comes back with a fastball in a perfect location, up and in, up and in again, and you see Chipper can't quite get to it. He tried to go up and in again, and he keeps missing. He was trying to throw two perfect pitches up and in after two strikes, and he was not able to do so. Boone at second, Jones at first, Jordan to the plate. 
Yoshi gets strike one after a brief visit to the mound by the pitching coach Dave Wallace. And Bob, when you pitch around Chipper Jones at this point, you're not really doing yourself a favor because Brian Jordan has been the hottest hitter the Braves have in the division series against the Astros. And he actually led the team in runs batted in with 115. A ball and a strike. Jordan had all five RBIs in their big game three extra inning win at the Astrodome. And he punished the Mets this year. 359, three homers, 13 RBIs against New York. Key contributors against the Astros with Chipper Jones not doing his usual damage in that series. Jordan skies one to right. Cedeno in for the catch. Too shallow for any advance, although Boone tries to draw a throw. Yoshi was able to get the fastball up and in on Jordan, and it didn't quite get extended. Since he's had the bad wrist, a lot of teams have tried to pitch him inside, and I think that's where you pitch him. But if you make any mistakes trying to get the ball inside, he's made him pay. So that ball runs up and in, and he doesn't quite get to it. Good movement on the pitch from Yoshi. So Jordan's the first out in the bottom of the first. But Yoshi far from out of trouble as he has to deal with Klesko, who hit 297 with 21 home runs. Throw into second with Ordonez sneaking in behind Boone, who gets back. Valentine managed in Japan in 1995 did not manage Yoshi and didn't even manage against him they were in opposite leagues in Japan yep. but Valentine speaks functional Japanese he told us he has about a 600 word Japanese vocabulary and Yoshi he said speaks baseball English very well any baseball terminology Yoshi understands so between his grasp of English and Valentine's grasp of Japanese no communication barrier the inside corner, one and one to Klesko. Andrew Jones will be next. Sliced foul and out of play down the left field line. And that's when Yoshi's at his best. He went inside with a fastball for a strike, and then he moves the fastball out on the outside corner, tailing away from Plesko. Greg Maddox had a nine-pitch first inning, and Yoshi has already thrown 21 pitches here in the bottom of the first. And his one-two pitch. Is hit in the air to right. Cedeno moving over. Boone tagging at second as Roger makes the catch. Boone advances. Runners at the corners with two out. Well, the one thing that Yoshi has been able to do is just get in enough on both Brian Jordan and Ryan Klesko to keep the ball in the ballpark. After going away for strike two, he comes back inside. And you can see that he jams him just enough to keep the ball in the ballpark. If that ball is six, four inches out over the plate, he hits it into the upper deck probably. You can see right off the handle a little bit, and he doesn't get all of it. So now Yoshi, trying to keep things tidy and leave his team with only a one-run deficit, has to retire Andrew Jones. Fastball is high. And we'll have to see what Chipper Jones does at first base. He's a good base runner, good base dealer. If he wants to take off, I think he can at any time. He couldn't check. A ball and a strike. Andrew Jones is asking the home plate umpire, Ed Montague, to ask the first base umpire. But you can see it, he clearly committed on the pitch. And Montague said he didn't need any help on that one. Going away from third, Jones from first, and the 1-1 pitch. Grounded to third, and Ventura has it. Across the diamond, low throw, and Olerud scoops it out. 
Braves score one and leave two. And after one, one nothing Atlanta. Championship Series is brought to you by MasterCard. MasterCard, proud sponsor of Major League Baseball and fan of the great American pastime. By Sun America, the retirement specialist. By Brewery Fresh Budweiser, official beer of Major League Baseball. This Bud's for you. And by Wendy's Bacon Mushroom Melt. When you gotta have one, you gotta have one. Piazza Ventura and Hamilton in the New York second. Ball one the count to Mike. Piazza had that aching left thumb treated with a cortisone shot between games two and three of the Arizona series. Had an adverse reaction. Swelling plus additional pain. Brought on Todd Pratt to be the unexpected hero a couple of days later. And you see what Greg Maddox wants to do with Piazza. He starts the ball off the plate outside and lets it move back over the outside corner. And the one problem that a thumb injury causes, especially on your left hand, is that if that's your drive hand, that's where you get your power from. He reaches for it, rolls it toward the hole. Chipper Jones on the move. Throws it Chipper Jones showing some range there. He was actually in the shortstop position when he cut it off. Well, it's a breaking ball, curveball down and away, and Piazza pulls it. You see how far off the line Chipper Jones starts. They don't play Mike Piazza to pull down the line. Cuts over in front of shortstop and makes the play. Side to Robin Ventura. How Ed Montague calls balls and strikes will be crucial tonight. Greg Maddox lives on the corners. The question is, where is the corner in any given game? Lofted to left. Gerald Williams with the easy play. For all you need to know about the baseball playoffs, log on to msnbcsports.com. Among the highlights, the Reds' Barry Larkin will prove be providing a player's perspective all the way through the World Series. Plus, you can follow each game of the NL and ALCS pitch by pitch and access a real-time box score with our exclusive total cast. MSNBCSports.com, the official website of NBC Sports. Here's Darrell Hamilton taking ball one. Bob Sandy Koufax, who we had on the air with us last Friday in New York, probably gets a pain every time I talk about pitching inside to some of these hitters because he feels that he pitches just like Greg Maddox, and that was to stay toward the outside corner. And I said, yes, yeah, Sandy, you could pitch out there because you're overpowering, and Greg can pitch out there because he has great movement. But the other hitters have to come inside or pitchers have to come inside every once in a while to keep them honest. And well, he came right inside on this one. Well, I think you have to. Uh, you know, you open, you use the outside corner 90% of the time, but you come inside every once in a while like he does there with a little cut fastball. And a call, strike three. Maddox's first strikeout. He set down the first six he's faced. Bottom of the second, Eddie Perez to start it against Yoshi. And he takes ball one. This is the eighth consecutive time the Braves have been in the National League Championship Series. Each of the last two years, though, they were upset by the wild card Marlins in 97 and by the Padres in 98. And like 97, the Braves have to face not just a wild card team in the League Championship Series, but the second place team from their own division that they beat over 162 games, but that earns a rematch under this playoff format. Perez drives one to right center field. Hamilton won't get there. It rolls to the wall. Eddie on his way to second, and he'll stop there with a leadoff double. It seems when it, Yoshi is trying to start people off with the fastball, he overthrows it. Then he gets behind 2-0, and, oh and he takes a little bit off the fastball to throw a strike, and Perez rips it to right center field. He took like three miles an hour off of that fastball to throw a strike, and Perez finds the gap in right field. He's going to have to stop falling behind these hitters, or he's not going to be in this ballgame very long. He's only thrown two out of the seven 
hitter's first pitch strike. So he's going to have problems pitching from behind in this ball game. You can't do it that way against the Braves or any other team for that matter. Here's the switch hitting veteran Walt Weiss. Looking to at least pull the ball to the right side and move Perez up. Maddox, a very good hitting pitcher, is on deck. Weiss, an off year at the plate, which despite his defensive skills is what led them to acquire Jose Hernandez from the Cubs. Side two and one. The leadoff double by Perez was the third hit off Yoshi in an inning plus. Well, there, it's un unusual to see a pitcher throw inside to a left-handed hitter when they're trying to keep him from pulling the ball to the right side, but that's what they're doing. A weak wave at it, two and two. Well, that was the splitter, which I don't think he's made as good a use of as he normally does at this time. Well, he's thrown three fastballs inside, and he comes back with a splitter. You can see Walt Weiss way out in front. Yoshi could use a strikeout. That's and he gets it as Piazza holds on to the foul tip. Well, that's his first strikeout, and that's the first time he's really used his splitter two pitches to a hitter in the same at bat. He got ahead with one. He comes right back with another one, and Weiss swings and misses both of them. I don't think he can stand out there and throw a lot of fastballs. He can't overpower these Braves hitters, but he can trick them and keep them off balance with the splitter. So here's Maddox, who hit a couple of home runs this year. He batted 172, which is not his best season at the plate by far. Last year, he actually out hit his opponents. Opposing teams hit 220 against him. He hit 240 against the league. Oh, and two. But they're still showing him the respect of a good hitter. You can see that he's averaged 15.5 wins prior to this year. And he's won all the Cy Young Awards. This season he had 19 wins. But the highest earned run average probably that he's had in a long time. A ball and two strikes. Perez who doubled at second with one out. Bottom of the second. one nothing Atlanta. Maddox stays alive. It was interesting. You could see that Mike Piazza tapping his side of his head. And he says, think now where you want to throw that pitch before you just let it go. He threw a splitter, but he hung it a little bit. Piazza says, I want you to think a little bit out there. You've got a pitcher up here with two strikes on him. He'll probably swing at anything if you start it in the strike zone and sink it out of the zone. Too. They say the swelling on the left thumb of Piazza. They can laugh about it now since he's back in the lineup feeling much better and Pratt did so well filling in for him. But they say it was almost comical. But it swelled up like a character in a cartoon. You know, it gets to be like five times its natural size. The negative reaction of the cortisone shot. A little pop wide of first and foul ground. Olerud back to snare it by the tarp. Most of the other infielders get all the accolades, but Olerud has become a very good fielder. We saw him save Ventura in error early in this ball game. He finds out where the tarp is, tracks it down, and he keeps the runner at second base. Perez could not have tried it anyway. But he doesn't. He's not running very well right now. So back to the top of the order for Gerald Williams, who singled, stole a base, and scored a run in the first.
swings on the first pitch again and hammers it to center. Darrell Hamilton on the move for the catch. The leadoff double from Perez goes to waste. Still 1-0 Braves. Bottom of the order for the Mets in the top of the third against Maddox, who's retired six in a row. Not anymore. That string is broken. Cedeno, first pitch swinging, splits the gap. On his way for two and maybe more. He rounds second and holds there. Now the ball gets away on the throw back into the infield, and Cedeno makes third. Good heads-up base running there by Cedeno. He stopped at second, but he followed the ball all the way in. I think a lot of times you're better off trying to hit the first pitch on Greg Maddox because that's usually the best pitch you're going to get. That's a fastball, kind of belt high and out over the plate. So Daniel rips it into left center field. They made a good job of picking it off the wall. And then when Gerald Williams' throw came back in, Maddox actually deflects it. I'm sorry, that's Weiss that deflects it. Maddox was in the proper spot. And they give it an E7, but that's a that's not correct. That was not that shouldn't go on the air on the left fielder. But they do charge it to Gerald Williams. Ball one to Ordonez. You see Roger Cedeno, he never gave up. He's watching the ball all the way and he sees it gets away. And he heads for third. If he would have just given up on the play, he would have had to stay at second because Maddox was backing up the play. Mets with a chance to tie. Ordonez nubs one in front of the plate. It's picked up by Perez, and it's a fair ball. A fair ball, and he pegs it to Klesko at first for the out. Ordonez is arguing. Perez picked it up right on the chalk. Ordonez thinks the ball is foul. He thinks it's going foul. But you can see it's right edge, edge of the ball is still on the chalk line right there. Still on the chalk when Perez picks it up. Good call by home plate umpire Ed Monahue. So now Yoshi tries to help himself. And the infield's in. They're not going to concede that run with Yoshi at bat. And this is a situation where if you're the Mets, you have to be alive for a squeeze. I mean, if you're the Braves, you have to be alive for a squeeze from the Mets. Yoshi hit 164, knocked in two runs. No sign of the squeeze, ball in the dirt, stopped by Perez. 2-0. A little slider from Maddox. And it breaks into the dirt. Good job by Perez. He didn't try to catch it. All he tried to do is stay in front of it and block it. With the infield in, the 2-0 pitch. Here comes the squeeze. He misses the butt. They've got Cedeno hung up. Side squeeze because if you don't execute and he got a good fish to hit but look at this this ball's right there he just misses the bunt so you can't blame Bobby Valentine for putting the squeeze on he picked the right pitch he had the pitch to make the play and the pitcher didn't execute look at this right down the middle and he misses it but Roger Cedeno is kind of hung out to dry there I think it was a very good play by the Mets to try to get the run home Yoshi hits it right back to the mound. The Mets had a man on third with nobody out, and they squander the opportunity. To the bottom of the third at Turner Field. Still 1-0 Braves. After failing to advance the runner on the attempted suicide squeeze and then tapping back to the mound for the third out, Yoshi was very upset going back to the dugout. In fact, Bobby Valentine had to talk to him in Japanese. Finally, Yoshi said, Des, I guess meaning I'm okay. 
And then Bruce Benedict also saw them. He just now took the mound after the rest of the infield and the outfield had been out there waiting for him. So he obviously was very upset about the way he was batting and not advancing a runner. Rob. All right, Craig, thanks. Bruce Benedict, normally the bench coach for Bobby Valentine, is coaching third base at the beginning of this series because Cookie Rojas, after a confrontation with umpire Charlie Williams in game four of the division series at Shea against Arizona, an argument in which push literally came to shove, Rojas has been suspended by National League President Len Coleman for five games. They have Rojas's number eight jersey hanging in the dugout but he is among the missing through the first five games of this series. And Bob, that causes the Mets a lot of problems. First of all, you lose your third base coach who knows the speed of your runners and knows how to wave them around. And you lose your bench coach who helps make the strategic decisions for your ball club with your manager. Brett Boone had an RBI single his first time up. Well, they have his jersey in the dugout, but he'll be missing for five days. They're all on a strike. There are a lot of things that happen differently when you have a different third base coach. They're used to taking the signs from Rojas, and Ruth Benedict has a different pattern of giving those signs, and you, we may miss a sign or two before this night is over. Fastball high. But they got the play right when they wanted to squeeze, and Yoshi got the pitch to bunt. Everyone executed properly except Yoshi. So Daniel didn't give it away, neither did the third base coach. Check down at first, he didn't go. Boone will be followed by Chipper Jones and Brian Jordan in the Atlanta third. Maddox has expended little energy through the first three innings, just 30 pitches. A bouncing ball to short. Ordonez, who last made an error on June the 13th, throws him out. This Sunday, folks, NBC continues its coverage of the inaugural Gravity Games. This weekend, all eyes will be focused on the vert ramp as skateboarding legend Tony Hawk takes his game to the half pipe and goes for Gravity Gold in the Skate Vert Finals. That sounds very exciting, although I have absolutely no idea what I just read. Plus, you can see some absolutely crazy stunts as freestyle motocross gets underway. That's the Gravity Games. Coverage continuing this Sunday at a special time, 2 Eastern, only on NBC. My vert ramp. <laughs> Got to get on and off the vert ramp. Be sure to turn the directional on. Chipper Jones. You can see they really have decided they're going to pitch Chipper inside, and I guess if they miss, they walk him. But I think that the way they pitched him the first time up was good. Fastballs in, maybe even off the plate, and then splitters away. Like that. I think that, if you throw him a hard stuff inside, that makes him have to react to the pitch inside, and that makes him react a little quicker on the split finger, and you'll get him to chase a few pitches, especially if you can get ahead in the count. Another splitter. Yoshi has it. Jones is done. Now it'll be Brian Jordan with the bases empty and two out. Jordan, according to Bobby Cox, really has his stroke back, and you could see that in the Houston series. He had eight hits and seven RBIs. He brought in his personal trainer, Bobby Kersey, the husband of Jackie Joyner Kersey, who not only trained Jackie, but has trained Gail Devers and other great Olympians. Apparently, he's regained a lot of the range of motion in that wrist, and much of the discomfort is gone. Well, Bobby Cox told me earlier this year, just after Jordan was hurt, that he had done everything that he had could possibly do to drive in runs. He said, any time you get a runner at second base, he was able to pick him up. He said, you put a runner at second base, and Brian Jordan never left him. And he really likes him as an RBI man and a good defensive right fielder. A broken back bloop, and Alfonso drifts back to take it. Yoshi works a perfect third. First time that's happened for him. 1-0 Atlanta. Economy of effort for Greg Maddox so far. He was in trouble in the third. Mets had a man at third with nobody out. He got out of it. 
Ricky Henderson fouls it off to start the fourth. With his ground out in the first, Henderson is now 5 for 24 in his career against Maddox. Apparently preparing to turn it on in the postseason, as has been his career history. He didn't steal a single base in the last 14 games of the regular season. Swiped six in four games against Arizona. 0-2. He had stolen only 10 in the season's second half. When the spotlight becomes brighter, Ricky steps up. The 0-2. Maddox dispenses him. Well, Maddox gets everyone with movement. All those pitches were as a result of movement. I mean, watch the movement on every pitch. I mean, it never ends up where it starts, and that's the key. Here's the last pitch. Started off the plate. Look at the rotation. Moves back over the outside corner, and Ricky knows it. Alfonso hit the ball hard his first time up, lined to Williams and left. Well, if you just watch Alfonso, he's aiming everything to right field, basically. But if you throw him some curve balls and off-speed pitches, which is what Maddox did in the first inning, he will pull the ball. That's what makes him so troublesome. All the scouts will tell you he will hit, hit any pitch almost anywhere. Without making premature comparisons, a bit like pitching to a Yogi Berra or a Roberto Clemente. Fouled off two and one. In that, they will hit pitches out of the strike zone with authority. They will hit pitches in various parts of the strike zone hard. Well, that two and zero pitch is what makes Maddox special. When a lot of pitchers get behind two and zero, they're just trying to throw a strike. Maddox gets two and zero, and he throws a slider on the outside corner. A drive to left center field. In pursuit, Jones with Williams. It splits them. On the track, Williams picks it up, and Alfonso has a one-out double. The only time Maddox gets hurt is when he gets the ball up. He got the ball up to Cedeno. He hits a double. Now he gets another fastball up. Now watch, this pitch is up and basically over the middle of the plate. And Alfonso drills it up the gap in left center field. You'll see that this ball kind of splits the plate, and it's up. Now Olerud in an RBI spot. He bounced to the mound his first time up. Line it a right. It drops in front of the charging Jordan. Alfonso is stopped at third by Bruce Benedict. Good play there in right field by Jordan. He was playing rather shallow anyway. And a good job by Benedict at third base to hold Alfonso. He was not going to be able to score. jumps on this first pitch the fastball tailing away and he rips it to right field now watch how quickly Jordan gets to this ball you see he's rather shallow and then he uncorks a good throw to the plate and they hold Alfonso at third base here's Piazza who grounded a third in the second inning first and third one out a broken bat roller, foul ball, barely foul. All of this action, including what some of the fans thought was an error, irrelevant. Piazza back to the plate. Well, he gets in tight on Piazza, man. He broke his bat. I mean, he jams him. He shatters his bat. Ball was way off the plate inside. And the ball is definitely foul as it passes third base. Mike Piazza grounded into 27 double plays this year, the highest figure in the National League. One of the things that Piazza does when he tries to stay out of the double play is he goes the other way. And Maddox knows that he'll do that as well, so he comes inside and jams him with a fastball. All strike two. That's just an amazing pitch right there because he throws a fastball and he jams the guy. The hitter's protecting the inside part of the plate from that moment on, and he just hits the outside corner right on the edge. He 
his 0-2 pitch. Just missed high. And Maddox wanted that pitch. He thought he got the outside edge. I'm not so sure that he didn't feel it that it was high. Oh, here we see the outside part of the plate. Ball. The one two. Two balls and two strikes. It's an interesting situation here because Bobby Valentine will hit and run every once in a while to try to stay out of the double play with Piazza. But you have a slow runner at first base in Olaru. Not going, and the ball fouled off. Greg Maddox won 19 games this year, 19 and 9, actually slightly better than his 18 and 9 of a year ago. But his ERA in 98 was 2.22. This year, it jumped to 3.57, his highest in more than a decade. The bat is shattered. Chipper Jones plays it off his chest, recovers in time to get him at first. But the run scores from third as Alfonso comes across to tie the game at one. Well, if Piazza keeps the face in Maddox here, he's going to need a bat order. Again, he pitched him away, away, he fouled off the second pitch. Now he comes back inside. Look at the ball tail in. Just shatters Piazza's bat. But it becomes a tough play because the barrel goes out. Chipper Jones sees the barrel. He has to try to feel the ball. And he finally corrals it and throws the first base to get Piazza. Got good play there by Chipper Jones. You see Bobby Valentine, he's just happy to get the run in. Because remember, Maddox shut them out a couple of times. Ola rooted second with two down. Ventura cuts and misses. This year, Greg Maddox had his fewest strikeouts since 89, his fewest complete games since 1987, and allowed more homers than any time since 91. Of course, everything's relative. He's still one of the league's best. Leo Mazzoni, the pitching coach, longtime pitching coach for Bobby Cox. Greg Maddox won 19 games this year for the fourth time in his career. He has twice been a 20-game winner. Two and one to Ventura. And Bobby, a lot of people may be wondering, well, Piazza got jammed twice. Does that hurt his thumb? No, it hurts your right thumb, the top thumb, but not the ones that's already injured. He falls behind in the count, three and one. Daryl Hamilton is on deck. situation where Maddox fell behind Ventura and he wasn't going to give in and he said if you want to if you want to swing at a pitch out of the zone go ahead he probably has more confidence in getting out getting Daryl Hamilton out in this situation plus Hamilton not a power hitter is not going to hurt him like Ventura could if he throws him a fastball that he can handle first walk issued by Maddox Hamilton struck out to end the second fouled away Maddox had laser eye surgery in July, didn't miss a single start, so he has ditched the eyeglasses and the contacts, and that nearsightedness has been corrected. Well, you see Eddie Perez going out to talk to him, and that's because Maddox is starting to get the balls up. The pitch to Hamilton there was a fastball up in the zone. The pitch that got him in trouble this inning originally, Alfonso's pitch was up. And you see 20 pitches already here in the fourth inning whereas he only had 30 going into the fourth inning. One and one to Hamilton. Start of the year in Colorado. He had 315 overall, but better than that in New York. 
339 for the Mets. It bounces away from Perez, but Olerud is unable to advance from second. Good job by Perez to keep the ball in front of him. And we mentioned the only drawback of the Mets is the middle of their lineup does not run well. And you can see he's turned that pitch over like a little screwball, but Perez keeps it in front of him. And no one can advance. Olerud, Piazza, and Ventura, not your speedy runners that you like in the middle of the order. Maddox has it. Winner of nine consecutive gold gloves. Flips it over to Cresco to end the inning. But the Mets even the issue at one as we head for the bottom of the fourth. NBC's coverage of the National League Championship Series is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. No matter what you want to achieve, we can help. By Coors Light, frost brewed to tap the clean taste of the Rockies. And by Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. Masato Yoshi is even again as we move to the bottom of the fourth. The rotation has done Yoshi no favors. He drew Randy Johnson game one of the division series. Greg Maddox game one of the LCS. Let's go fly to right his first time. Gets under this one and lifts it foul down the right field line. I think Mike Piazza has done a great job with Yoshi tonight. He hasn't been happy with the way he was throwing, but he's kept him fighting. He makes him battle. He gives him a little sign afterwards. See right there, he's saying, slow down, stay back, and make sure you make the pitch that we want. One and one. Anytime a pitcher is struggling, and Yoshi started to struggle in the first and second innings, you can get a lot of help from your catcher. He can guide you through these troubled waters. Skies won the center. Actually, left center field, Henderson over with Hamilton, and it's Henderson for the catch. The wind is blowing across from right field to left, and it pushed it over to Henderson. Well, right there was a good example of what I was talking about with Piazza. He made him work inside, then he gave him the target low and away, and he threw the splitter. So Piazza's value is far more than just as an offensive player. He does a good job of calling pitches as well. Andrew Jones, check swing, right back to Yoshi. Two gone. Baseball tomorrow as coverage of the playoffs continues. Game two from Turner Field, 4 o'clock Eastern time. Millwood against Rogers. And at 8 Eastern... Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Bob Bradley and company from Fox at Yankee Stadium. Game one, Red Sox, Yanks. How about that Boston-Cleveland series and what Pedro Martinez did last night at Jacobs Field? Just remarkable. Eddie Perez had a double his last time up. Moves away, ball one. The whole game looked like batting practice until Martinez came in. Not only did he stop the nonsense, no one even touched him for a hit. Six hitless innings in a game that looked like home run derby until he showed up. And you can see the difference in pitches this inning with Yoshi. He has two outs now with only six pitches thrown. See that little fist that Piazza gave him? He wants a little pump on that fastball. And you see him give him the sign, yes. You can learn a lot about how a pitcher is throwing by watching the catcher. And you can see Piazza is helping Yoshi a lot. He says, I want a little extra on the fastball. He got it. And he pointed out to him, nice job. Well, he wants this fastball up a little bit. Well, not a good job there. Piazza definitely has Yoshi's respect. In Los Angeles, he caught Yoshi's close friend, Hideo Nomo. Two, two to Perez, foul back. Eddie Perez has done a good job this year. He's a good receiver, but he hit just 249 with seven home runs. With Javi Lopez out the second half of the year with a bad knee, they lose a lot of production 
from the catcher spot. Combined, their catchers had 40 homers and 133 RBIs in 98. There's Javi. This year, the combined figures 19 and 80. He reaches for it, lifts it to left. Henderson started in, now goes back. The wind playing with it, and he takes it on the warning track. What's going on, says Ricky, when he made the play? On to the fifth, Cedeno, Ordonez, and Yoshi against Maddox. Cedeno doubled to left center to start the third. Taps this one, and Maddox makes a leaping grab, and then shovels it over to Klesko. This is how you win nine straight gold gloves. His chopper, and he leaps up and gets it. And he's going to have to go in and uh, get a new jock strap. <laughs> How do you diagnose that equipment watch. problem from this distance? I know what he's doing. He had to go in. Watch. He's gone inside to get another one. That may be a little more information than they needed, but he definitely have to go inside. That would that would be a jock snapping stretch. Well, he has left for one repair or another. All the Mets are swinging at the first pitch. I mean, their approach to Maddox, as you indicated, is pretty clear. He always gets ahead of you. Why dig yourself into a strike one hole? The first pitch might be the best chance you get. Let me say this. If, in fact, it was what you thought, he is a quick change artist. Well, what he basically does is I don't think make we a need quick to know. change of equipment. Let's go to Jim Gray, who specializes in matters like this. Well, I don't know about that, Bob. I'll leave it to you and Joe for that. However, Pat Corrales does tell, it, tell us that there was an equipment repair that was necessary, not necessarily replacement. Bob? Thank you so much, Jim. A strike to Ordonez. little roller was picked up by Perez who pegged him out at first in the third. Greg Maddox has won four Cy Young Awards, four ERA titles, and ranks among the nine or ten greatest pitchers in the history of baseball in the opinion of most. Squid toward first. Lesko has it unassisted for the second out. But in postseason play, Maddox has been very human. After his division series loss against Houston last week, he's 9-9 nine and nine in the postseason. And if you take the division series out, he's 5-8 and eight in the LCS and World Series combined. As you see, he has generally pitched decently, ERA 3.02, but not magnificently as he has during the regular season. Another 1 2 3 inning as Yoshi rolls to Boone. As you may know by now, Wilt Chamberlain died today at the age of 63. Jerry West played with Wilt in Los Angeles, won a championship with him in 1972. Here's part of what West had to say today. And he was just, um, uh, you know, he was he's one of those fabulous players that kind of defines sports. In attendance tonight in Atlanta, a man who helped define his sport, Wayne Gretzky. He's with our Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Well, Wayne was well acquainted with Will Chamberlain. They both live in Los Angeles. What are your thoughts, Wayne, on his passing? Well, obviously, everyone's devastated by it. Uh, not only was he a great athlete, but uh, he was a wonderful sports fan. He did so much for uh, the Los Angeles Kings and the NHL trying to promote our sport in the L.A. area. Uh, any favor I called upon him, he was always there to answer. And and, uh, you know, I always say that Michael Jordan is the greatest athlete I've ever seen, but I really never got a chance to see him uh, in his prime. And I, from what everyone tells me, uh, my good friends tell me he was the greatest athlete they ever saw. Wayne, we appreciate your time. We know it's a difficult moment for you and all fans. Thanks for talking about Will with us. All right, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, back upstairs to you in baseball. Jim and Wayne, thank you. It's a fact that in addition to his awesome basketball accomplishments, Will was a fine volleyball player, excelled in various track and field events, 
Weiss starts it against Yoshi in the bottom of the fifth. Yoshi has retired nine straight batters, Bob, and he's starting to use his splitter a lot more effectively here in the last three innings. A liner down the right field line. Cedeno had it played way off the line. Weiss on his way to second. And a leadoff double that snaps a string of nine consecutive Braves retired by Yoshi. Yoshi starts him off with a splitter and gets a strike, then he comes up and in with a fastball, and Wise has always been a good high fastball hitter from the left side. And there's a the fastball up, and he pulls it down the line. But they were playing him around to left field, so he pulls it down the line. No chance for Cedeno to run this one down, and Wise ends up with a double. Along with being a good pitcher and a good hitter, he's also a good bunter. So we'll see. I'm sure that you're going to see the Braves try to sacrifice Weiss over to third base. He doesn't disguise his intentions. He squares, bunts it toward third. Yoshi stumbles as he picks it up. But Alfonso, covering first, makes a nice scoop. A successful sacrifice by Maddox. Weiss in third with one out. And that could have been disastrous if Yoshi hurt himself on the throw. He threw off balance and he threw it in the dirt. Nice pickup at first base by Alfonso. But it appears that Yoshi has injured himself. And watch, this is the way you want to bunt. You want to bunt the ball down the third baseline. You Technically, you want the third baseman to have to field it. But Yoshi's slipping and stumbling. And he finally throws low. Now watch this good pickup at first base there by Edgardo Alfonso. Well, he just starts to slide right there. He turns his ankle, and then he kind of rolls over on his right ankle, but he really, I think it's his left ankle that he injured. The throw to first base is low. Nice pick out. Right there, you can see him turn his left ankle. Right there, you see him turn his right ankle a little bit, but I think it's his left ankle that he's hobbling on. Let's listen to the Braves' third base coach, Ned Yost, on the play as Maddox lays it down and Weiss moves from second to third. Come on! Come on, Walt! Right there! Watch the toe! Watch the toe! Yoshi is saying he's okay. Bobby says, make sure you're okay. And he says, all right. On another subject, Bobby Valentine told us before the game that some of the furor over his comments concerning Bobby Cox may have been overblown. He said he voted for Cox as manager of the year. One of the writers said to him, why are you voting for Cox? Not questioning it, but just asking him to explain his reasons and expand upon them. He said, well, this year, and this is Valentine now quoting himself, I said, this year, Bobby really had to manage. Now, the really was left out of the quote, according to Valentine, and it sounded like, well, this year he had to manage, finally, because he used to have all the horses, and this year he faced injuries and adversity with the illness of Galarraga, and so it sounded like a backhanded compliment, and some people interpreted it that way. Let's go to Craig Sager. He's got a report on Yoshi. Well, official word is a twisted left ankle. Yoshi does not wrap his ankles before he pitches. However, if he gets through this inning, trainer Fred Hina said that he will wrap it. Um, Craig, thanks. Gerald Williams wraps it through the ground in infield. And Weiss drops home with a go-ahead run. Now the ball juggled and left by Henderson, and Williams moves to second. Gerald Williams has seen three pitches in this ball game, and he has two base hits. He's jumped on the first pitch he's seen each time he went to the plate. The Mets tried to trick the Braves. They were playing back when this inning started. They're back here. Now they'll run in, and what you do there is you try to catch the guy at third base going because he thinks you're back, but that backfired on him because the ball was hit past Ordonez. First pitch, fastball, he smokes it in the hole. 
and the Braves have a two to run lead and the ball gets away right there from Ricky Henderson. So Gerald Williams ends up at second. And Boone takes the ball. RBI single, E7. And Bobby, a lot of people wonder why you run the infield in in that situation because it limits your range if you do not get there quick enough. Well, you can trick the opposition into think you're playing back and they will send the runner from third and you can throw him out of the play. You almost have to consider playing in as the Mets did there, even only midway through the game, in a 1-1 game because you're facing Maddox. Tomahawk chop on the familiar chant filling Turner Field. The Braves have drawn better than three million in each of their three years here, but some of the fans aren't exactly juiced, at least not yet, about the Braves in yet another postseason. There are many empty seats in the upper deck and right. Pat Mahomes up in the Met pen. Ball strike, two and two. As of yesterday, there were 6,500 tickets remaining for game one and 10,000 still unpurchased for tomorrow's game two. Daniel, and as I said earlier, the Mets have one of the best defenses in the history of the game. Now watch this great play. He just lays out and catches it right in the end of the web. That's a great play. He got a great jump on it. And just a great play there by Roger Cedeno. Great concentration. Keeps his eyes right on the ball. Nice play. Well, when you hit the ball, you say, well, it's a base hit. You think it's a base hit, and you see a guy make a play like that. <laughs> you want to throw your helmet, but you think better of it. And we saw Williams go back and try to tag up. He played it properly. You go halfway with one out if you're not sure they're going to catch the ball. And the fans don't want to First base open, two out, intentional walk to Chipper Jones. And I told you what, you have to go after Chipper when you have the opportunity, and they did so the last at bat. But in this at bat, I think the best thing for him to do is to walk Chipper with first base open. So they'll have to face Brian Jordan, who's 0 for 2 tonight but who led the Braves with 115 RBIs. Chipper Jones walked 126 times during the regular season. Well, I think you walk it because he's left-handed, and then you get a chance to pitch to the right-handed hitting Brian Jordan. You've been able to handle him the first two at-bats in this ball game. Valentine dispatches Wallace to the mound to make a pitching change. Pat Mahomes was up. Yoshi's going to leave on the short end of a 2-1 score with two out and two on in the bottom of the fifth. And we'll be back to Atlanta right after this. Craig Sager back at Turner Field where Masada Yoshi has just been pulled. We mentioned earlier the mild temper tantrum he threw after he did not advance the run on a suicide squeeze. Just now he went to the locker room. He broke his bat and threw a couple of chairs and is throwing quite a tantrum now underneath. Now let's go over to Bob. Craig, thanks a lot. Enter Pat Mahomes, 8-0 for the year with an ERA of 3.68. Mahomes has pitched great down the stretch coming in and getting them out of jams and get it retiring the one hitter that they need in clutch situations. So he's pitched exceptionally well the last couple of weeks of the season. Jordan was 0 for 2 against Yoshi. Blocked by Piazza. Oh, he 
talked about Piazza doing a good job of calling pitches. You see right now, does a good job of keeping this ball in front of him. You see all he's trying to do is block it, and it stays out in front of the plate. Williams at second, Chipper Jones at first. Two out and a run home in the fifth. 2-1 Atlanta. Call strike, 2-1. Good pitch there by Mahomes. Here's Jordan's direction of base hits. And you see most of the time he goes to left field. He was late on that one, two and two. of September the aching wrist cut into his production. He's back in a group now. Good pitch. This one off. That was a good pitch by Mahomes because it was up and in and out of the strike zone. Not a lot that Jordan could do with it. Another 2-2 pitch. The ball's not carrying in that direction tonight. And at the edge of the track, it's Hamilton with the catch. On another night, that might have gone for the distance. The Braves score one, they leave two, and take a 2-1 lead to the sixth. the sixth top of the order Ricky Henderson to face Maddox 0 for 2 on the night grounded out struck out bounce to third on the short hop Chipper Jones that's a nice play there by Chipper because he had to come in and try to get it on the short hop he didn't get it clean but he was on his way in and it's and he caught it in rhythm and watch, if he stays back, he'll get a bad hop. So he charges it. Now he tries to get it on the short hop. He gets it on the in-between hop. But because he was moving forward, I think he was able to keep it under control. And then he throws Ricky out. It was a much more difficult play than it appeared. Ball one low to Alfonso. And watch what he has to do on this play. See, he's back. Now he has to make a decision. See, right there he comes in. That's a very difficult play. Alfonso blistering just about everything he sees these days has hit it hard twice tonight lining to left and doubling to the gap in left center. When Maddox threw a curveball he hit hard to left field the first at bat. He doubled on a high fastball to expect him to try to change speeds on him. I don't think he's going to throw him a lot of curveballs but he's going to try to change speeds. More change ups and sliders rather than curveballs and fastballs. behind 2-0 and oh, you have to come after the hitter and Maddox decided 2-0 and oh, I'm gonna make him hit the ball I have a one run lead and make him hit his way on base 2-2 two and two. No, that was a high change up not a good pitch for Maddox but the speed fooled Alfonso Stays alive by tapping it foul. Tomorrow, it's Rodgers against Millwood. Millwood, probably the best pitcher on the Braves staff this year, despite the career achievements of Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz. Won 18, pitched a one-hitter against Houston in his division series start. So the matchup favors the Braves. Just missed. Game three at Shea Stadium on Friday night. It'll be lighter against Glavin. Then it's Rick Reed against John Smoltz in game four on Saturday. So the way Bobby Valentine has it figured, if there's a seventh game, lighter, probably his best clutch pitcher, would be ready to pitch it. Alfonso again rips one down the left field line, and it's in there, a fair ball. 
on his way to second with his second double of the night. Well, he tries to get him out with a slider this time, and he doesn't get it down. He gets a slider, hangs it a little bit. And Edgardo, who is swinging the ball that so well, just rips it down the left field line. Now watch, this is a slider that kind of hangs up there, and he rips it down the left field line, and it stays fair. And Edgardo is swinging the bat exceptionally well. And the ball hits about foot fair. The Mets' fourth hit, three of them doubles. 2-5-1 for Atlanta, 1-4-1 for New York. Olerud is grounded out and singled. The outside on deck. Strike one. Despite the Mets' woeful recent history against the Braves, losing 9 of 12 each of the last two seasons and 13 of their last 14, in this ballpark, there's precedent for this kind of upset. And remember, for about a three-month stretch before the seven-game swoon in late September, a lot of people thought the Mets were the best team in the National League, if not in all of baseball in the season's second half. But if you want to look to history, the Mets themselves lost only one game in 88 against the Dodgers. There was no division series then. They met in the LCS, and the Dodgers beat them in seven games on their way to the world title. In 83, the Phillies won only one game from the Dodgers, but beat them in the LCS. The slate is wiped clean, and it's a best of seven. Olerud's liner is foul. At least, though, it is a best of seven, a truer test than a crapshoot best of five. pitch fouled away Thank you very much. Piazza will be next with his lead from second. Another 0-2 pitch. Hits softly into center field. Here comes Andrew Jones to take it. And that's where Andrew Jones playing shallow really helps him. He was playing shallow and he got a good jump on the ball and he made it an easy play. Piazza has the Mets lone RBI. His ground out scored a run in the fourth. Alfonso came across on the broken bat roller to Jones at third. Maddox got in on Piazza several times in that at bat, broke his bat twice. Strike one swinging. Piazza actually likes the ball out over the plate. So if you can pitch him inside, you pitch him up and in, you have more success. There's a fastball up and off the plate. But when Piazza looks for the ball inside, he'll take it inside out at the right center field. Has as much power the opposite way as almost anybody in baseball, a possible exception, Mark McGuire. One and one. Piazza was slumping down the stretch. He hit 303 for the year, just 245 in September. And in the division series, before the aching thumb forced him out of games three and four, he was just two for nine with four strikeouts against Arizona, and both hits were singles. Maddox gets the call strike, one and two. And that's what only Maddox can do. He throws two fastballs up and in, and then he just hits one right on the outside corner. See how it tails back? It gets a piece of it. But the great thing about Maddox there, he just went a little further off the plate than he did the pitch before, 
And Piazza just trying to protect the play. Leo Mazzoni rocking back and forth, as is his wont. What Maddox does is makes you a defensive hitter rather than an aggressive hitter. And when you do that, you're at his mercy. Again on one and two. Slow roller to short. Weiss has it with time for his piazza. Alfonso doubles but doesn't come across. 2-1 Atlanta. Bobby Valentine has used his Japan connection tonight. Masato Yoshi has started. Pat Mahomes, who the last two years pitched for the Yokohama Bay Stars before returning to the major leagues, has come on in relief. Brian Klesko in the bottom of the sixth takes high. of Andres Galarraga set off a chain reaction. Klesko has played mostly at first base. A lot of time has also gone to Randall Simon. There's the big cat. And Brian Hunter. But Galarraga averaged 130 RBIs over the previous two seasons. Klesko drove in 80 this year while hitting 297 with 21 home runs. The 2-1 pitch is bounced to Olerud. It's off his glove. Does he have time to recover? No. That was a high chopper. It appeared that Olerud was going to be able to make the play. We'll get a look at it here. The high chopper, he gets there, just reaches up, and it goes off of his glove. And by the time he retrieves it, no chance to get Plesko at first base. So a rare infield error for the Mets, who made only 33 of them on the infield this year. An all-time Major League low. New York's second error of the night. Henderson made one earlier in left field. Jones takes high. You look at this kid, still only 22 years old, and he's been in the big leagues for three plus seasons. Tremendous all round talent. And you can see they do not want to throw him a fastball that he can handle. Throw him a 2 0 breaking ball there after starting off with a slider and then a breaking ball. Good fastball hitter as most young players are. Mahomes 1-1 one, one pitch. That'll also make the seats. Jones won his first gold glove last year. Perhaps the first of many. He is already a very accomplished center fielder. He hasn't come of age yet, at least not fully, at the plate. He hit 275 with 26 home runs, but he's a five-tool guy who could blossom into a superstar. At times, he's frustrated his manager, Bobby Cox, who's fined him several times for indifferent play, but in terms of talent, you're looking at one of the major's best young players. pitch. Off the home's glove, picked up by Alfonso. Toward third, there's a base. I mean, they do this routinely every day. This is just a beautiful infield to watch. I mean, they make all the great plays. They make they make spectacular plays. They make the routine plays. There's another curveball. Jones lines this one off the glove of Mahomes, but it still looks like it's going into center field. Edgardo picks it, leaves it for Odonias. He just bare hands it and fires to first base. I mean, we see this with Vizquel a lot. He will just bare hand the ball instead of transferring it from his glove to his hand. And right there, he avoids the runner. It's just a beautiful play. Ball one to Eddie Perez. You hate to just toss it off, but that's almost a routine move for Ray Ordonez. 
to barehand the ball that way. So the rare infield error by Olerud, but the Met infield immediately erases that mistake by turning two. One and one. And you score it one, four, six, three. and a strike. Braves got one on the bottom of the first. Mets tied it in the fourth. Atlanta goes ahead with one on the fifth. A long drive to left field. Turning is Ricky Henderson. To the track. To the wall. Big night for Perez. Double and a homer. And a bit of breathing room for Maddox. Weiss is struck out and double. In there, one and one. two-out single, and Weiss is two for three. Mahomes is, was throwing a few curveballs, was hanging. He hung one to Andrew Jones. He hit it back through the middle at him. This one he hangs, and you can see where it is, right above the belt. And you can see the charge that Eddie Perez puts into it, high and deep. And there you see Holmes' reaction. He knows that he made a bad pitch, and Perez deposited it in the left field seats. Diving back is Weiss. Maddox to the plate. Popped out and sacrificed. His battery mate has helped him in this inning. of the 90s for the Braves is a story of tremendous achievement and tremendous disappointment. And some of these fans have learned not to get their hopes up, at least not until the World Series. That partially explains some of the empty seats. Game one of the LCS. One and one the count. against the Braves in the 97 NLCS as a member of the Marlins up in the Met bullpen. Maddox is late on the fastball, one and two. strikes, two outs, a run home in the sixth, and Weiss at first base. Maddox hangs in. Looked at Bobby Cox a moment ago in the Brave dugout. He says of all the baseball men he's encountered, his first big league manager, Ralph Houck, in the late 60s with the Yankees, has had the greatest influence on him. Tough but fair is the way Cox describes the major. The high heat finishes Maddox, but Perez's homer gives the Braves a 3-1 lead as we move to the seventh at Turner Field. As he lunges. 
pitches one into the Atlanta night. Craig Maddox has required just 76 pitches to work the first six innings. Starts Ventura with ball one of the seventh. Daryl Hamilton on deck, then Roger Cedeno. One and one. The one thing that Maddox does is he seems like he always able to get to a hitter's weakness, whether that's the changing speeds or moving the pitches in and out. But he always seems to keep the hitter off balance, and that's what pitching is. It's about keeping hitters off balance, whether you do that with a 99-mile-hour fastball, whether you do that with a straight change, whether you do that with a slider or a curveball, it all accomplishes the same thing. And Maddox basically just knows how to keep you off balance. The bottom dropped out of that one, two and two. What's the old Warren Spahn quote? Hitting is timing. Good pitching is upsetting timing. Mike Remlinger, the left-hander, in the Atlanta bullpen. Pitchers think of it as timing. Hitters think of it as balance. Full count. Maddox has walked one. He struck out two. And induced a slew of ground outs. Chipper Jones. It finally comes down, and that's how difficult a chance it was. I mean, it was up there about half a mile high. And he staggers to his knees as he makes the catch on the mound. Well, Chipper stays with it. He battles this. It was high, but you can see all of a sudden he had to reach out and make the catch. He thought he was under it. Right here, it looks like he's under it. It's going to be an easy catch. Then he has to extend a little bit, and he actually caught it right in the palm. Which brings up Hamilton, who's 0 for 2. On the first pitch, a chance in center for Andrew Jones, who comes loping in and has it. Maddox has faced four hitters over the minimum to this point. about tomorrow's baseball schedule. We're back out here for a late afternoon game. Four Eastern time from Turner Field. Game two, Rodgers against Millwood. Game one of a great rivalry in the ALCS, the Red Sox and the Yankees. Eight Eastern time on Fox with Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Bob Friendly from Yankee Stadium. Cedeno, just looking to make Maddox throw some pitches, bluffs the bunt and takes a ball. You're looking at his line, one for two, double was caught stealing. The caught stealing was charged to him when Yoshi missed on the suicide squeeze attempt. They call that a attempted steal of home. Russ Springer, the righty, joins Remlinger. Yoshi blew the suicide squeeze attempt. Sedeno was dead between third and home. Tagged out, unassisted by Perez. So, but Ed Montague granted him time. Well, sometimes Maddox likes to get in the rhythm and he likes to pitch quickly. And so Daniel wasn't ready. That one's in there. So Daniel is an interesting story. He stole 66 bases this year, second in the league to Arizona's Tony Womack. Coming into this season, he had only 23 career stolen bases. Bobby Valentine cut him loose. Goes the opposite way for a two-out hit. Now 
the Mets trail by two. They've got their number eight hitter, Ordonez, at the plate. Is this a situation in which Cedeno should run? No. I don't think he will. You have to be sure. Maddox doesn't hold runners that well because he doesn't worry about them. So, I mean, you can steal the base if you're 100% sure, but you cannot get thrown out in this situation. The Mets' best pinch hitter, Matt Franco, is in the on-deck circle. Maddox giving him a little concentration there, but normally he just gets on the mound and worries about the hitter. Donez, who hit 258 for the year. He had one homer, a late season grand slam against the Phillies. But he did knock in 60. Not bad from the bottom of the order. Of course, with his glove, if he can hit above 200, especially considering all the other firepower Bobby Valentine has in his lineup, the Mets will live with him. Trying the old hidden ball trick there. Ryan Clesco had the ball in his glove, and Greg Maddox was walking around the mound. You can't be on the dirt if you do not have the ball. Clesco is trying to get Sedano to move off first base. The 1 0 pitch, but first another throw, and this time he has to duck back, and Clesco thought they nabbed him. Maddox gives him a quick move to first base. You see the feet of Cedeno as he dives back. And he's safe, but it was a close play. Maddox thought he might have had him. Ordonez lines it, and Maddox spears it. an act of self-defense and maybe a lucky play. But this guy has won every pitcher's gold glove in the decade of the 90s. And he closes out the seventh with this. ABC's coverage of the National League Championship Series is brought to you by the all-new Chevy Monte Carlo. The side you show the world is up to you. By the people of Allstate, you're in good hands with Allstate. And by Taco Bell. Take a look at the last play by Greg Maddox that ended the inning and just watch this in full speed. Yeah. You have to remember that a pitcher is very vulnerable when he throws, and a lot of times you know, the, the ball comes back at you so quickly you do not have time to react. But Maddox always ends up in good fielding position, and he usually reacts when the ball is hit back through the middle. So the fans settle back in after the seventh inning stretch. And a new Met pitcher on the scene, Dennis Cook. In his 11th year in the majors, with his eighth different big league team. That's not even including the second tour of duty with the Indians. Generally, it's his job to face a left-handed hitter or two. It'll be Williams, Boone, Chipper Jones from the right side, and then Brian Jordan if anybody gets on here in the seventh. Williams has swung at the first pitch in his previous three at bats, so he takes one finally. Pretty good pitch there by Dennis Cook, low and away. As you see, Williams has had a good night with a couple of hits, a steal, an RBI, and a run scored. working out of the stretch a ball and a strike cook is 37 years old he was 10 and 5 this year his era was 3.86 two and one he's always been a situational guy proof of that he has only seven career saves although most of his career he's been a reliever 
but not a closer. Stop for Donez. It all seems routine with him. One out in the Atlanta seventh. And coming up on NBC. NBC Wednesday on the West Wing when the stakes are this high. Wait, to win. And I mean win. Somebody's got to lose. Are you saying that I should be talking to a lawyer? The West Wing Wednesday. That's tomorrow night on NBC. Brett Boone is one for three. He was robbed of a hit on a tremendous play in right by Roger Cedeno his last time up. Entering this October, Dennis Cook has a sparkling postseason record. Twelve innings pitched, no runs allowed, two hits in those twelve innings, and 11 strikeouts. One and one. It's a fair ball. Ventura across the diamond to retire it. And now Chipper Jones bats with two out and nobody on. A couple of weeks ago, Joe, we were here in Atlanta when Dennis Cook was brought in to face Chipper Jones, turn him around from the left side to the right. Jones had homered earlier in the game, lefty against Rick Reed. He won the game with a right-handed homer in the bottom of the eighth off Cook. And a lot of people were wondering why John Franco wasn't the guy brought in because it's more difficult to get the ball in the air off of Franco than it is Cook. And the fact that Chipper Jones was swinging the bat so well at the time. He was just about unconscious at that point with his swing. That was game one of the three game series here which Atlanta swept with Jones homering four times. Then they took two out of three a few days later in New York. Left the Mets reeling. Not only with no chance to catch them in the division when once they had been just a game behind, but two back in the wild card chase with three to play. But the Mets swept Pittsburgh, got some help from Milwaukee, tied the Reds, beat them in a one-game playoff, and then won the division series against Arizona to set it up again with Atlanta, a team that thought they had buried New York. Baylor has been the reason that he has learned to hit better from the right side with more power I should say. Don Baylor talked to him in spring training and said a guy that's hitting in the third and fourth slot we need a little more power from you from both sides. And Chipper decided just to be a lot more aggressive when he was swinging from the right side and it's paid off for him. More home runs right handed this year than in all the previous seasons of his career combined. That one misses the inside corner two and one. Speaking of Don Baylor, one of the most respected men in baseball, he interviewed yesterday for the Cubs open managerial spot. He's also on the list, supposedly, for the vacancies with the Angels and the Orioles. In there. twice once intentionally grounded out his only charged at bat full count to it we see an interesting number 33 of his 45 home runs this season were solo home runs but a lot of that has to do with the fact that the first two guys in the order did not get on base for very often 318 on base percentage jams him and although he makes contact he almost had to hit that foul looked like a little slider or cut fastball that Dennis Cook wanted to throw inside yeah a little cut fastball and chipper out in front of it pulls it foul Nobody on. 
3 1 Atlanta, bottom of the seventh, and another 3 2 pitch from Cook to Jones. Walked it. Three free passes tonight for Chipper Jones. Well, they actually pitched to him in this at bat. It just turned out to be a base on ball. The first inning, they actually went after him a little bit, too. The third time up they had an intentional walk because they had a base open so I, I think they've tried to get him out they're just not going to make pitches and leave them out over the plate Jordan has flied out popped out and then flied to deep center Cook made him wait too long in at his catcher for his sign like a man who's truly troubled or perplexed. Look at the expression on his face. Looks like he's saying, you want me to throw that? Ryan Klesko doesn't hit left-handers well. In fact, he had only five hits all year against left-handed pitching, so Howard Battle is in the on-deck circle if the inning is prolonged. In addition to all his other exploits this year, Chipper Jones found time to steal 25 bases in just 28 attempts. And then scampering back to the bag, and the count goes to 2 0 on Jordan. Ed Yost on the lines at third. Glenn Hubbard is their coach at first. Brian Jordan is, of course, a popular figure here in Atlanta. He used to play defensive back for the Falcons. Deciding to concentrate on baseball only. Jones goes from first, and Piazza won't even throw. A two-out stolen base. Well, I believe the way that the Mets hold you on allows you to steal the base if you're a good base dealer. See, he's so far off the bag, he can't get back there in time. So his first move, you can take off for second base because even if they throw it to first base, if he's moving back that way, you're not going to be able to stop and throw to second base. And now they just complete the walk to Jordan. So the Mets trying to hang close, down by two runs with two turns at bat remaining. Face a sticky situation here. Howard battle off the bench to pinch it for Klesko. Working carefully to Jones, they walk him on a 3-2 pitch. Then he steals second as the count goes to 3-0 on Jordan. Jordan then has issued the walk. And battle who had only 17 at-bats with six hits, an average of 353, steps in. Well, you also become a better defensive team because you hit battle for Klesko, and then you let Brian Hunter, who's an excellent defensive first baseman, go in to play defense when you have a lead here in the seventh inning. had big league cups of coffee with the Blue Jays in 95, the Phillies in 96. Spent parts of nine seasons in the minor leagues. Jones a lead from second, Jordan from first. Braves with good speed on the bases. And Cook's 0-1 pitch to battle. In there, 0-2. Klesko was 0 for 3 on the night. Now a spectator as battle hits for him in the seventh.
One and two. Jones at second. Jordan at first. Hook peering in for that sign. And delivering on one and two. Piazza and Cook thought they had battle. Montague thought it just missed. Well, he got the strike two call out there. He went out there again, and this play ball is clearly off the plate. You can, you can see him move the ball back in. You can see the glove moving by Piazza. That tells you that the ball was way off the plate. was working on an easy inning. Now Jones and Jordan will take off on the 3-2 pitch. Seven years old. Kirk Wendell up in the bullpen. Howard Battle has waited a long time for a chance like this. Perhaps the most important at bat of his life. Even though his team leads, he's never been in a spot like this before. And Battle continues to battle at the plate. Hanging in against Cook. trying to decide what happens if he doesn't get battle out. Are you going to go to the bullpen right away? Or what are you going to do? Andrew Jones is the next hitter. And you have to try to stay close. It's the seventh inning. You have six outs left. So you still have time to come back. There's Andrew Jones. He would be the next hitter. And he got it. The Braves strand two and still lead by two as we move to the eighth. Howard Battle, who fanned as a pinch hitter for Ryan Klesko, stays in the game and replaces Klesko at first. Maddox went out and warmed up. Well, Bobby wanted to get the pinch hitter out there, Matt Franco. Now he can bring a left-hander in and make Bobby either let Franco hit or use up another pinch hitter. Round of applause for Maddox. He's done after seven. So the Mets announced Matt Franco, their best pinch hitter. He had 20 pinch hit walks this year and 14 hits. And as soon as the announcement is made, Bobby Cox yanks Greg Maddox and goes to the lefty Mike Remlinger. Well, what he does there is just force Bobby Valentine to use an extra player is all he's doing because now they can pinch hit for Franco and still get the matchup that they want. So Franco is pulled back, and Melvin Mora will come on to hit for him. And the wheels continue to spin. The new first baseman is Brian Hunter. Well, and obviously Bobby Cox planned this move well in advance. And what he's doing, he's going to put Brian Hunter in the nice slot now so he doesn't have to pinch hit. So he double switches. And Remlinger, who was 10 and 1 in 73 appearances this year, with an ERA of 2.37, which is truly microscopic these days in baseball, runs the count to 1 and 1 on Mora.
Mora runs up and misses the bunt. Good idea by Mora. You, you need base runners if you're the Mets. And he's pinch hitting for the pitcher spot, so he's just trying to get on base. And that's one of the reasons they kept him, not so much for his bat, but because he plays an intelligent brand of ball and he can run. Morris had some big moments the last several days. He scored the winning run as a pinch runner on the wild pitch by Brad Klontz in the last game of the regular season against the Pirates. And he pegged a runner out at home in the division series. He caught Jay Bell at the plate in game four with a throw from the outfield. Rocker is the closer, and he's emerged as one of the National League's best. The right-hander Springer was throwing earlier. Remlinger, who was a Met in 94 and 95, brings it home on 2-2 two and, two and misses way high. Maddox had only thrown 89 pitches when he was removed from the game, and only 30 of those were balls. The 3-2 pitch. Fouled off. Leo Mazzoni still rocking. Wonder what he's like at home. Sitting on the sofa. Watching ER on a Thursday night or something. Well, Morrow works a walk. Tomorrow afternoon, Mazzoni and company will be back in place at 4 Eastern time watching game two. Kenny Rogers will pitch for the Mets. Kevin Millwood for the Braves. <laughs> Capacity at Turner Field is just over 50,000. They just announced the paid attendance as 44,172. So about 6,000 unoccupied seats for game one of the NLCS. Henderson's over for three. Capable of tying the game. He's hit 12 home runs. And he's especially has an opportunity to tie the game against a left-handed pitcher. He, he can hit for more power if he sets up and tries to drive the ball late in the ball game against a left-handed pitcher. Alfonso, a real home run threat these days, will be next. A man aboard, tying run at the plate in the top of the eighth. A ball and a strike. And Ricky thought that pitch was low. side two and one I'm pretty sure that when we get to Shea Stadium for game three on Friday games three four and five over the weekend in Queens you won't find any empty seats of course this October marks the Mets first postseason action since 1988 it's become a habit in Atlanta a little bouncer of its foul Is he the MVP in your judgment? Speaking of Chipper Jones, as we look at all the division titles, eight of them in, the, in a row, skip 94, of course, because of the strike. And actually, that was the one year they might not have won it. They were trailing the Expos in August at the time of the strike. They won all the other division titles beginning in 91, for which they competed. Henderson's little bouncer in front of the plate is grabbed by Redwood, who his only play is to first. And Mora moves to second with one down. As Edgardo Alfonso heads for the plate, we remind you his power surge has carried the Mets the last two weeks. He got them going in the one-game playoff against the Reds. He homered twice in game one against Arizona, including a grand slam. Then in the deciding game four, he also delivered a solo shot. homers in less than a week. 
One of them off Randy Johnson. He's lined to left and doubled twice tonight. The Braves in the NLCS for the eighth time in this decade. Trying to get a leg up on their fifth trip to the World Series in the 90s. Charging it is Boone. That takes care of Alfonso. More of the third, but with two out. Good pitch by Remlinger. The ball looked like it was going to be a strike, and at the last second, it sunk down. Alfonso tried to hold up on his swing, but he couldn't do so. Now watch this pitch. It sinks right there, and he tries to hold up on it. Too late. And that's a big out for the... Braves to get because Alfonso has been swinging the bat very well tonight. And right there, you see, he tries to check it. And that'll be all for Renlinger. Rocker had been throwing. And nothing wrong with using your closer for an out in the eighth. And then allowing him to work the ninth. It's a good thing they don't use a bullpen cart anymore. I don't know what Rocker would do if he had to ride in. Watch him come charging to the mound. We'll be back. Arriving at a near sprint to take the ball from Bobby Cox. Cox told us in his office before the game that during the division series in Houston when Rocker came in in that tight situation in the 10th when he arrived on the mound which at the Astrodome is on a hydraulic lift. He actually jumped down on it so hard he made the mound shake. Cox felt it shake. He starts Olerud with strike one. Remember Olerud homered off a hard throwing lefty, perhaps the hardest throwing lefty of all, Randy Johnson in game one of the division series in Arizona. Two quick strikes. They roll for Rocker here. He'll hear the booze at Shea. He's expressed his disdain for the Mets and for the city of New York. Small town Georgia boy, born in Statesboro, Georgia, grew up as a Braves fan in Macon. Says he was at the game when Bob Horner hit four home runs in one game in '86. Steps off and looks Mora back to third. Rocker says he still has the scorecard from that game. He had only two career saves and had been a starter most of his minor league career when he became the closer almost by default this year when Terry Leitenberg was hurt. He then saved 38. Wendell, the right-hander who is as idiosyncratic as any lefty who's ever graced the major leagues. Former Cub, now in his third year with the Mets, you see his numbers in 1999. Trying to keep it close enough to give the Mets a crack at it in the ninth. Andrew Jones fouls off strike one. Thus far tonight, Braves pitchers have held Ricky Henderson to 0 for 4, and Piazza and Ventura a combined 0 for 5. They check it first. No. The ball and a strike. One and two. Alongside Don Baylor, thinking about closing it in the ninth. Three balls 
and two strikes. Wendell sporting that necklace, which includes, among other things, at least a couple of shark's teeth. Jones to start the bottom of the eighth, bringing up one of tonight's heroes, Eddie Perez, who has doubled and later homered. That's what he did his last time up in the sixth off Pat Mahomes. Dave Wallace, the pitching coach, comes trotting to the mound. The Met bullpen is quiet. Well, the one thing that bothers Bobby Valentine more than anything else is based on balls. I mean, he doesn't even like to give intentional walks to guys like Chipper Jones who are swinging the bat well comes in and he walks the leadoff hitter here in the eighth inning and you're already down three to one. They're chanting and chopping once again at Turner Field. Although relatively muted at this point. Perez looking to butt after his power hitting earlier tonight. He slams on the brakes and makes Wendell chase him. Moving to second in scoring position with one out is Andrew Jones. Very rarely do you see a guy hit a home run and then the next time up have to sacrifice, especially when your team is leading. Well, he squares around and drops down the butt perfectly down the first baseline. And Wendell chases him back and tags him. And I think Perez felt like he tagged him a little too hard, but and he's still staring at him out there. The way John Rocker has been throwing of late, Bobby Valentine's team is up against it anyway, trailing by two. They can't afford to give up any more. Here's Weiss, who struck out, doubled, and singled. And Wendell misses with ball one. Although, as we mentioned earlier, Weiss had an off year at the plate, batting just 226 after an all-star season in 98. I think we're going to see a whole lot of him in the postseason where his glove will be so important. Well, that'll just depend on whether the Braves are able to score runs. If they have trouble scoring runs, they'll go to Jose Hernandez for run scoring ability. But I think tonight they felt like Maddox throws a lot of ground balls. They wanted their best infield defense out there, and that's what they got. The 1-1 one -one pitch is hit the opposite way, and Ordonez dives and comes up empty. Jones being waved home, no throw from Henderson. Third hit of the night for Weiss and a 4-1 Atlanta lead. Well, everything is going to Braves' way. You sacrifice with a guy that just hit a home run, and what happens? Weiss picks him up for you. Good job by Weiss, low slider that doesn't do a lot, and he lines it just out of the reach of Ordonez, who makes a dive, but he can't quite get there just out of his reach and only a guy like Andrew Jones would have been able to score a guy with a lot of speed because he had to wait and there you see Rocker he says well great now I have a three run lead to work with and here's Brian Hunter in the night spot after the double switch a half inning ago you know the Mets and the Braves both want to win this ball game but they want to win it a little more because they want to beat each other I think there's a little extra intensity between these two teams And Bobby Cox downplays the rivalry. Bobby
Bobby Valentine told us before the game, I have no problem with Bobby Cox. I think he has a problem with me. Two balls and a strike. We put the same question to Cox, and very diplomatically, looking to defuse anything, if in fact there are any ill feelings, he said, you know, I have no problem with anybody. And it was Cox who, before the series began, said, the lack of respect angle is a joke. You either come to play baseball or you come to talk. And both teams better come to play baseball. Misses and a full count. In addition to winning the division, their eighth straight division title, the Braves excelled against playoff teams. In interleague play, they had to play the Red Sox and the Yankees. So they played five of the seven other teams that made the playoffs and went 26 and 11. Then goes the runner on three and two, and it's fouled off. So Weiss comes back. Several indications of what a good team this is, besides their continuing success and their perennial presence in the postseason. They're 18 and 5 in extra inning games. They've won 31 games in their last time at bat. Weiss goes again, a swing and a miss for strike three. The throw is not in time. Weiss at second with two out while we have a chance. This play of the game is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. Succeed on your own terms with Merrill Lynch Unlimited Advantage. It comes in the fifth. A slicing drive off the bat of Brett Boone and a fully extended catch by Roger Cedeno in right. So the Braves with a better bullpen and an ability to move runners to execute the bunt and the hit and run appear to be a better team in close games this year than they may have been in recent seasons. Well, the last two years, they've depended basically on the home run hitters. I mean, they've had some big guns in this offense, and they were more of a home run threat. They still do not have your prototypical first and second place hitter that you need in tight ball games, but they've been able to manufacture runs, hit and run, and they run the bases very, very well, and I think that's one of their keys. Gerald Williams looking for his third hit of the night. He singled twice, stolen a base, knocked one home and scored one. That'll be in the seats foul down the right field line. In the ninth, the Mets will send up Piazza, Ventura, and Hamilton against John Rocker. One and two. who knocked in a run and stole a base in this inning at second with two out. And Williams spoils that one. I asked Bobby Cox before the game if he would go to Hernandez at shortstop, right-handed hitter with Kenny Rogers, the lefty, starting tomorrow for the Mets. And he said it's something to think about, but he wasn't sure. Well, tonight, Weiss has given him additional food for thought. Three hits plus a stolen base. Inside, two and two. Walter has doubled and singled twice. Call strike three. 
Williams disputes it, but only briefly. An insurance run at the bottom of the eighth. 4-1 Atlanta. NBC's coverage of the National League Championship Series is brought to you by the all-new 2000 LeSabre by Buick, re-engineered to be safer than ever. By Fidelity Investments, we help you invest responsibly. And by Gatorade Thirst Quencher, helping you play longer and stronger when it counts the most. Gatorade, is it in you? The Braves are on the verge of beating the Mets for the 10th time in 13 tries this season. Piazza, Ventura, and Hamilton in the ninth. Mike is 0 for 3. His fourth inning ground out did produce the Mets' only run. A ball and a strike. It was John Rocker who toured the end of the regular season after the Braves... Had won five of six from the Mets in the space of barely a week. It was Rocker who said, how many times do you have to beat a team to make their fans shut up? He'll find out on Friday night that that figure may be incalculable. As long as the Mets still have a chance and a rematch with the Braves, Rocker and Chipper Jones and everybody else is going to hear it at Shea. They come to their feet at Turner Field. Rocker, who struck out Olerud on three pitches to end the eighth. Gets Piazza to roll at the second. Brett Boone. Looking back between innings, Turk Wendell, who gave up the fourth run. Talking with John Olerud. And then displaying some disgust with himself. Restrained would not be among the adjectives used to describe Wendell. Ventura 0 for 2 with a walk. need two runners to have a chance. starter Al Leiter. He'll open at Shea on Friday night and pitch a game seven if there is one. Just miss two and one. If you take a look at this game, you know, you see why the Braves won over 100 ball games. They execute when they have the opportunity. They've had two sacrifices. They were able to go ahead and sacrifice the runners. They were at a couple of stolen bases. And most of all, they've been able to keep Ricky Henderson off base. And if you look at the other side, the Mets have not been able to move runners. They blew a suicide squeeze. They didn't get the runner in from third. So they've just not been able to execute as well as the Braves have. And that therein lies the difference in the ballgame. Rocker stepped off. The count to Ventura, two and two. So the Braves have gotten their customary fine pitching, and they played small ball with the Perez homer thrown in. Called strike three. And tonight's Chevrolet player of the game, the Greg Maddox. He worked seven strong innings. He stands to be the winner. Eddie Perez and Walt Weiss received consideration as well. Bobby Valentine goes to his bench. Sean Dunstan comes up to hit for Darrell Hamilton.
And the Mets have to think about this. They go from Maddox to Millwood. Who right now is in a tremendous groove. He's the game two starter at 4 Eastern time tomorrow. ball Chipper Jones knocks it down and can't find it Dunstan's aboard and it'll have to be scored an error on Chipper Jones well Chipper has bobbled three balls down at third base he's been able to make the play after the others he gets there he short hops it knocks it down he's been able to pick it up on the second hop normally and throw the guy out at first base but not able to find the handle on this one and that's an E5. Well, Bobby Cox has his trip to a victorious clubhouse delayed. And the Mets are one man away from sending the tying run to the plate. Here comes Saturday's hero, Todd Pratt, to bat for Cedeno. Although Cedeno hit 313 overall, He's a switch hitter who batted just 194 right-handed, 334 lefty. So they get him out of there and bring up Pratt. And it gets by Perez, sending Dunstan to second. Scored a wild pitch. Four runs, eight hits, two errors for Atlanta. One run, five hits, two errors for New York unusual for these two teams with their generally outstanding defense especially the Mets to hook up and commit four combined errors a line to the left it'll drop for a hit heading home is Dunstan no play on him 4-2 game and the tying run to the plate Brad delivers once again in somewhat less dramatic style than Saturday, but nonetheless, he prolongs the ninth. Good job by Pratt. He gets the, looks like a fastball about belt high, and he rips it to left field for a base hit. And that keeps things going for the Mets. You always have hope if you have some outs left. Solid line drive to left field. Now, here's an interesting spot. Ray Ordonez is coming to the plate. The Mets still have Benny Agbayani on the bench, who has power, and Bobby Bonilla, a switch hitter, who is thought these days to be more dangerous left-handed, but has power. Now, Agbayani is in the on-deck circle, should Ordonez reach. The Mets have no true reserve infielder. They left Luis Lopez off the playoff roster. So that may enter into this, but Ordonez hit only one home run this year. 0 for 3 tonight. Strike one. Pitch to Ordonez. Foul ball. Two. And 
misses with that one, a ball and two strikes. Hunter obviously is behind Pratt, not holding him at first. Next one to Ordonez. And he splits it foul. so he doesn't have to deal with Agbayani, who would be next. Pratt goes, and Ordonez hits it hard and foul. And you can see Chipper Jones really guarding the line. He's not going to let a ball go between him and the bag for an extra base hit. Anything hit down there to get past him is going to have to be foul. You see where he is right there at the bag. And the ball pulled down into the bullpen. Donez battles. If you're the Mets, you're just hoping that Ordonez can get on base and give Benny Agbayani a shot. Then he doesn't have to hit a home run. All he's got to do is find the gap. Agbayani, there in the background, hit 286 with 14 home runs in limited duty. Trying to save it for Maddox. Chipper Jones again knocks it down, snares it with the bare hand, and hits across the diamond to end it. Unusual night at third base for Chipper. But it's over, and Bobby V's team is in an 0-1 hole. But remember, this is a seven-game series. There's a long way to go. Greg Maddox has his 10th career postseason win, and he's with Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Greg, your 10th career victory tonight. How important is it to get the first game in a series like this? Uh, it's always important. You always want to start off on uh, on the right foot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice win for us tonight. Uh, we need three more games, and, uh, you know, we're on the right track so far. You only threw 89 pitches, only 30 balls. Did you want to come out of the game, or did you want to finish? Well, I didn't want to come out, but uh, it was best for the team that I did. Uh, you know, I was kind of starting to lose it a little bit, and, you know, our bullpen's fresh, and it's better to have a fresh arm in there than a tired one. We've heard an awful lot of talk this week, Greg. Do the uh, Braves and the Mets dislike each other? <laughs> we have a lot of respect for their team. Uh, you know, uh, Ray Ordonez is one of the finest shortstops ever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're all screaming at you, Greg, yeah. here. <laughs> you know, uh, Alfonso's been outstanding. You know, Piazza's been one of the top catchers forever. Uh, we have a lot of respect for their players over there, and, uh, you know, we're just glad we won tonight. All right, Greg, congratulations, okay, Steve. Thanks. All right, Bob, back upstairs to you. All right, Jimmy, I guess respect is the word. Even Bobby Valentine says we have a lot of respect for them, but I see no reason why we should have any affection for them. Atlanta wins game one. Again, the final 4-2 to two. tomorrow at 4 Eastern. We'll be right back here to bring you Game 2 of the National League Championship Series between the Mets and the Braves. Kenny Rogers against Kevin Millwood. Now coming up after your late local news, it's The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Tonight, Jay welcomes actor Ving Rhames and the music of Creed. For Joe Morgan, Jim Gray, and Craig Sager, I'm Bob Costas. Good night from Atlanta.